Nine to Nine Church of Christ here in Sand Lake, New York. I'm Reverend Hafida Siddiqui, the minister of this wonderful congregation. And whether you are here in the sanctuary with us, or you will be joining us, say, on a Friday night or a Wednesday morning, we're glad that you're listening with us and, and, and being in fellowship with us at some time during the week. Those of you who are members and friends of the congregation uh, receive their bulletin by email. So if you are not on that list, please give us an email at uh, Zion Haberton. I was not to get it right. Zion Haberton Church at gmail.com. We can get the bulletin to you so that you can follow along uh, with the liturgy. Are there announcements that need to be made uh, as we continue in gathering ourselves together? There is one, and I've neglected <laughs> to make a flyer uh, to put in the bulletin, but on the 2nd of May, that's the first Sunday in May at 3 o'clock, we'll be having my installation here. I'm entering my second year but due to late COVID, we were prevented from celebrating uh, that uh, my coming here to start up my work with you guys. Uh, but it will occur on the 2nd of May at 3 o'clock. Now, it will be a hybrid service. It's not going to be on, on Facebook. It will be on Zoom. And I know some of you guys are uh, not wanting to be introduced to that platform, but nevertheless, we will make it as easy as we can. So it'll be a hybrid on Zoom and then also here in the congregation. So, uh, because not all of the participants can, can be here, but I'll tell a little bit more about that as we move on. If there are no other announcements that need to be made, let's continue in worship together using our responsive call to worship. And I'll begin. Here in this place, there are no foreigners, for all are welcome in God's house. Here in this worship, there is only acceptance for love is the language of faith. Here in our lives, there are no divisions, for God dwells in each of us. Together, come, let us worship in unity and love, and let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks, every thanks for this wonderful morning of sunshine and warm weather. We see the manifestations of your grace and your mercy and your creativity in growing flowers and grass and animals going here and there. And, and we seem to be moving a little bit lighter on our feet because of not so many clothes, gloves and mufflers. But nevertheless, we thank you all for everything, for every day that we have to breathe and to fellowship with our friends and loved ones and to make these new friends. So bless us now as we sing and as we worship, as we read and as we think about your loving kindness from generation to generation down to us. Speak to us and move in us, move through our hands and our feet so that we will do the work of love and compassion and justice and honor. We ask all of this in the name of the risen Christ, who loves us always. Amen. Friends, let's stand together as we sing for the fruit of all creation. It's found on page 5 in your hymnal. There is an introduction, so as you are willing and able, let's stand together and join this song together.
Lord and the Lord has found us and the Lord has found us again in this place, in this world and we'll find love, we will make love once we leave this place to do the work of a disciple, of a student of Jesus Christ. And we will be truthful, we will not always act in loving ways, we will not always recognize love when we see it, we will not always put ourselves in the way to welcome it. So before we move any farther, let us together confess our sins, our misgivings, our skepticism, but also hold ourselves open for God's forgiveness and mercy and love. Let's share together in our responsive prayer of confession. I'll begin. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. Lead us in the way, the way Christ walked. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Lead us in the way, the way Christ walked. The way of the new learning and questioning. The way of the river forward and the upper road. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Lead us in the way, the way Christ walked, together, the way of joy and life and sacrifice, the way of creation and the cross. So friends, use these few moments for your own silent prayer and confession. Friends of Christ, hear the good news. God says that I have loved you with an everlasting love, a steadfast love, a love that does not quit no matter what. And as far as the east is from the west, the north is from the south, up is from down, God loves us and pursues us and forgives us and strives with us again to do what is right. So friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are always already forgiven. So friends, let's join together in the glory. Glory to the Creator, the Christ, the Holy Spirit, three in one, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. And before you take your seats, please bid the peace of Christ to those standing next to you, or sitting next to you, as a sign of the friendship that we share in the household of God. Be surprised to be with you. I tried and I tried and I tried, 
but I couldn't go fast enough, and so I just stopped. I just stopped. Because what I was playing didn't sound like theirs. They could go fast, and they were playing these songs that I liked, and, and the teacher seemed to be really happy with them. She wasn't mean to me, but she encouraged me, but I just didn't want to do it anymore. But I can read music. I can follow along. It's like I can follow along when Connor's here with us. He's on, uh, out of town right now. But I just can't play fast enough. And then some way, somebody said, you just have to try maybe a little bit better. Just don't give up. Don't give up. And so I try. I keep trying. And I hope that one day I will get better and go faster. The story that we're going to hear in just a few minutes talks about commitment. And there was a lady who had to make this really big decision. And it was a decision that was going to ask a lot of her. She was going to have to like, wow, this is really big. I'm going to have to stay with this if I, if I do this. I'm going to have to really work hard at this. But she didn't give up. She kept going. And so when you get home, I hope that your parents and the rest of you guys can read the book of Ruth because it tells a story about staying with it, even staying with someone else who needs help and who can help us. So kudos to all of you who know how to play a, uh, any kind of instrument and, and, and celebrations to people who here who can speak all kinds of languages and, and decipher all kinds of complicated things, machinery and sewing. I can't do a lot of that stuff. I can do some things well. So I give God thanks for that. And with that, let's pray. Gracious God, thank you that my hands and my brain can do some things wonderfully well. And I pray that those here in this congregation who can do some fantastic things, that we share it with them, with one another. So help us not to give up. Help us to remember that it's sometimes always too soon to give up. Be with us as we try. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And can we have a volunteer for the offering? Oh, I think we've got a volunteer here. Thank you so much. Friends, let's uh, stand together as we share the doxology and give thanks for the gifts that we have dedicated to Christ. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Praise God above the heavenly host, creator of Christ and Holy Ghost. Amen. And let us pray. We give a portion of what you have blessed us with, O God. May you bless our offering. Come and work through these gifts and extend your love through us, we pray. 
There are a number of birthday and anniversaries this month and I believe this week. So we celebrate and say happy birthday to those who are celebrating birthdays and anniversaries and other kinds of good news. There has been a death in our family. Uh, Lauren Gilbert passed away. Uh, the uncle of Martin Ruby and others in our congregation. So let's be in prayer for his uh, family as they grieve his loss and celebrate his life. Are there others? If not, let us let us pray. Gracious God, God of creativity, God of change, God who loves us, God who sees us, God who journeys with us. We are grateful for your presence, the many ways in which you move in us and around us and through us. Not only us, but in this whole world that you are mindful of what's going on at any one time. We give you thanks that you make yourself known through goodness, through kindness, through small acts of love and courage, through insignificant, almost seemingly powerless things like compassion and color and music and art. We give you thanks for these things. Indeed, they are the most powerful in the whole world. We give you thanks this morning for this church and for her mission and her mission and vision how she has stood the test of time and remained strong in her. We ask that you continue to guide the leaders in this congregation and all of us as we minister to each other and we move out as a group and as individuals into all of the places that you would take us. May your love, the sweet smell of your love, that's always lavished on us, walk from the people with whom we come in contact, whose paths we intentionally cross. For those who are overjoyed because of birthdays and anniversaries and other good news, like vaccines and relationships in their home that have been healed and on their way to being healed, for those who travel and bring that good news, we give you thanks for all of that, for jobs, for homes, for so many things. And gracious God, we pray for those here in this congregation, here in this region, here in New York and around the world, who grieve and who mourn because they have lost something, a loved one, 
strive forward and plan. Rachel said, we're ever good faith people and folk with good intentions are found. May they do the work of compassion and accompaniment in the ways in which you can empower them. Rachel said, we do pray for Queen Elizabeth and her family for the passing of her husband, Philip. We pray for Lauren Gilbert's family as they laugh and cry all at the same time, remembering who he was and how, they, how he shaped their own lives and left an imprint that can never be erased. Rachel said, we ask that you show yourself faithful in coming alongside every single one who's known some loss here in this church and around this world, even in the United States, where it seems as if we are on a path of self-destruction. In our own way, with our own gifts, use us Use us to be light. May we be as yeast infiltrating this lump of humanity so that abundance and joy can be known. You call us to do fantastic things, a tall order live always from a position of love and justice and kindness and mercy. God, we know that there is such a thing as compassion fatigue, so we ask that you save us from giving in to it. Help us to pace ourselves, but to be mindful and watchful of how you use us so that we can be ready. And when our hearts and our hands and our feet tell us otherwise that this is all for naught, Lord, turn us back into a way, the way of your Son, and help us to pray the prayer that he taught us, regardless of the situation. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Morning, our scripture for this morning um, is not in Acts. I forgot to take that out. It's in the book of Ruth, chapter 1, the first 18 verses. Listen for what God has to say to us, the Spirit of God say to us in this passage. During the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. A man and with his wife and two sons went from Bethlehem of Judah to dwell in the territory of Moab. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Chuyan and Mehar. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, <coughs> Judah. They entered the territory of Moab and settled there. But Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. Then only she was left along with her two sons. Her two sons took wives for themselves, Moabite women. The name of the first was Orpah, and the name of the second was Ruth. 
and they lived there for about 10 years. But soon both sons died, Malon and Chilion. Only the woman was left without her two children and without her husband. Then she arose along with her daughters-in-law to return to the field of Moab because while, the territory, while in the territory of Moab, she had heard that the Lord had paid attention to his people by providing for them. She left the place where she had been and her two daughters-in-law went with her. They went along the road to return to the land of Judah. Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go, turn back, each of you, to the household of your mother. May the Lord deal faithfully with you just as you have done with the dead and with me. May the Lord provide for you so that you may find security, each woman in the household of her husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. But they replied to her, No, instead we will return with you to our people. Naomi replied, Turn back, my daughters. Why would you go with me? Will there again be sons in my womb that they will be husbands for you? Turn back, my daughters. Go. I'm too old for a husband. If I were to say that I, that I hope, even if I had a husband tonight, and even more, if I were to bear sons, would you wait until they grew? Would you refrain from having a husband? No, my daughters. This is more bitter for me than for you, since the Lord has come out against me. Then they lifted up their voices together and wept again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and wept. But Ruth stayed with her. Naomi said, look, your sister-in-law is returning to her people and to her guides. Turn back after your sister-in-law. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to abandon you to turn back from following after me. Wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do this to me, and more so, if even death separates me from when Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her about it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Such beautiful words. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to abandon you, to turn back from following after you. Where you go, I'll go. And wherever you stay, I'm going to stay there. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I'm going to die there. And I will be buried there. May the Lord do thus and so to me and even more. If even death separates me from you. More than likely, you've heard those words at a wedding. Specifically, when the partners are talking to each other, yet understood in their original uh, text, and when we take out the realm, take them out of the realm of romance and sentimentality, the meaning of these words is all more illuminated and profound. So if you are looking for a word to describe what's going on in this beautiful setting, I have a word for you. It's called accompaniment. Accompaniment. In his book, To Repair the World, medical anthropologist and physician Paul Fra Fra Farmer defines accompaniment this way. To accompany someone is to go somewhere with him or her, to break bread together, 
to be present on a journey with a beginning and an end. There's an element of mystery, of openness, of trust in accompaniment. The companion, the accompanier says, I will go with you and support you on your journey wherever it leads. I will share your faith for a while. And by a while, I don't mean a little while. <coughs> Accompaniment is about sticking with a task until it's deemed completed. Not by the accompanier, but by the person being accompanied. Friends, that's what Ruth was to Naomi, an accompanier. In fact, when you read the whole book of Ruth, you'll come to understand that that's also what Naomi was to Ruth. They were bound together in a relationship of mutual accompaniment, originally out of desperation, but later on by choice and by love. Ruth's choice to stay with Naomi was cataclysmic. It fundamentally changed her world. A new ethnic identity. One that wasn't looked very kindly on by other people. She had a new religion, a new home, and she also had an uncertain future. And she risked further ostracism and vulnerability. She could have made it. She could have had everything she wanted if she turned back to Moab. To Moab, a husband, a home, children, status. She could have had all that, but she said no. And she chose to take on risk that was not her own, a future that was precarious. She chose it anyway. And by this, we see that she wasn't about some kind of individualism or some unidirectional helping, but she was helping this poor, aged mother-in-law of hers. She made it did she have in her that she turned out that way to make such a decision? What is that stuff in us where we have made decisions to accompany people? And so they said, I think this is it. I think I've recovered. I've gotten what I had lost. Found what I need, and we stayed by them. Their cause became our cause, their pain, our pain. And then they released us, and we released them. A word, Orpa, Naomi's other daughter in law. She's always cast as the selfish, disrespectful daughter-in-law who chose wrongly, putting her own interests above her aged mother-in-law. We don't, we don't know what happened to Orpa, but drawing upon my own experiences of being stuck between having to make decisions, good decisions, in a hurry, that would impact the life my life and the life of my children, and also being in urgent need of somebody to help me. Caught between that and my own experiences of trying to be an accompanier, I choose to hope that Orpa went back to Moab. She went back home and she accompanied some other woman who was in critical need as she once had been. Her work, unlike Ruth's, was not to travel back with them, but to go ahead on home to Moab. 
And I think if we take it a little bit further, in some way Orpha had the more difficult duty, the more difficult task. She made a more difficult choice because she had to figure out on her own and in a hurry how to make a new life for herself out of all of the nothingness that she had been given. Again, I choose to hope that Orpha carried the memories and hopes and deep love that she shared with Naomi and Ruth as they stood together, holding each other, crying on each other in the middle of that road, at the crossroads of dislocation and death and despair. I choose that Orpa, like us, in cases in our life that we can point to, that she carried that same healing, powerful, potent energy and lavished it on another woman who desperately needed it. Church, we are not all called to go out on the other side of the world and accompany somebody. But maybe some of us are. And sooner than we think. And neither are, are we called <clears throat> to go to places near and far here in our own country, within the borders, even of New York. But maybe some of us are. And maybe sooner than we think. Yet surely, all of us are called by God the God of time and circumstance, the God of compassion and justice to accompany somebody, somewhere, somewhere, this week, next week, next month, someplace outside of our normal, the sphere of our own influence, outside of that, somebody, some where needs us to accompany them. Long ago, an elder in an Aboriginal activist group in Queensland, Australia, said this to some very wonderful, glad-hearted people who had heard of their plight and traveled across the world to come and help them. They said, this man said, if you have come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you have come because you understand that your liberation, your freedom is bound up in mine, inextricably bound up in mine, that there is no division, there is no line that marks you and me and our freedom as human beings, if you understand that, if you come here with that understanding, then we can work together. I think it was Emma Lazarus, the one who wrote the poem, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. She said this, until we are all free, we are none of us free. None of us free. Until all of us are free. So friends, whatever your work, factory worker, even if you are retired, teacher, artist, researcher, writer, insurance, whatever, artist, whatever you do to earn your daily bread, to earn the daily bread for those who love you and who love them. Whatever your avocation, your hobby is, friends, see it and carry it out as being tightly tethered to the liberation, the freedom of someone else. Indeed, all of us. Simply because famine and displacement and death don't always wear the same disguise every single day. They don't. 
They look different, but their effect is the same. A profound loss and estrangement, loss of joy and peace and being known and recognized as a human. Friends, let's trust that what our eyes and our ears see with our truest hearts, that that is what we need to pay attention to. And let us trust the voices that call out to us, whether they are in our own home, under our own roof, or somebody else's roof, next door, someplace around the neighborhood or around the world. But they are crying out for help, for accompaniment in a variety of ways. It's not always about giving money. A lot of it is about bearing witness, too. We pray, God, that the Spirit will show us and take us to that person this week some person that we can accompany, who we can help breathe life back into their own hearts and minds. And may we be effective listeners and learners and accomplices of justice with accountability, bringing in a new humanity in our own hearts and in our own world. Precious God, may the words of the book of Ruth dwell in our hearts and may it take root so that we can hear you clearly. And in due time, may they produce in all of us the fruit of righteousness. We ask this in the name of the living Christ. Our final hymn of the morning is Like a Mother Who Has Borne Us. I believe we sang this a little while ago, but there is an introduction, as always. So as you are willing and able, let's stand together as we sing this song.
God walks with us in every instance of our life. Our life and everybody's life. And sometimes the messiness of life, the way humans clash together, the way in which we get in our own way, we can't see God's hand. That's why we're here, to be the hands and the feet and the heart of God wherever we go. So friends, go out into the world this week in peace and be an accompanier because somebody needs our help. They need our joy. They need to know that somebody cares. Go in peace.